Today, we're really lucky because we have Shad Griffin of IBM. Shad is a data scientist, and he has worked in many industries besides his current role working and supporting a large healthcare client. He is a UNT alum, although not of the College of Information. He graduated with a Master of Science in Economic Research. Is that part of the College of Business, Shad? Uh, I am not sure anymore. It was the oh. Martian Sciences, but that was a oh. long time ago. Yeah, things I, are I always changing. Yeah, I'm not sure what college it's in now. Okay, so everyone, please join me in welcoming Shad to our code series talk on artificial intelligence. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I'm gonna put my mute on and you go ahead and get started. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Uh, so can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. All right. Well, um, you know, Lisa, thank you so much for just letting me uh, do something that I love to do, which is uh, blab about data science, um, you know, giving me that opportunity. And, uh, you know, uh, just a little bit more about my background. I, I've been working in the data science field for about 26 years. Um, I uh, started out, um, well, I spent, uh, I've been at IBM for about eight and a half years now. Um, and uh, at IBM, I've had various roles. Um, right now, I'm, I'm kind of a, a lead technical seller on a, a large healthcare account. But at IBM, I've had, uh, you know, several roles, including technical sales, uh, more of a, not pure research, but more of a research related role. And then also actual consulting or fulfillment, you know, doing work at a client site. Um, before IBM, I worked at Verizon for a long time. Um, well, Verizon and derivatives of Verizon um, through mergers and uh, spinoffs and things like that. Um, but uh, when I was at Verizon, I uh, led their data science, led the data science activities for, for one of their business units. So um, I've had a cup of coffee in a few other places, but most of my experience has, has been with either Big Blue or, or VZ. Um, I did go to UNT um, a while ago, and I, I got my master's in economics there, um, studied econometrics, and um, and then I also got my undergraduate degree at Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge. Um, on my screen, you see my LinkedIn. Um, please connect with me. Um, glad to connect with people. Um, and I also have some articles on Medium that I, I publish, and you can find them on my LinkedIn page um, on this topic and uh, lots of other different topics as well. Um, you know, so when Lisa first reached out to me uh, about doing this, she was pretty open in terms of what topic I could use. And, and the reason I chose this topic is I, is I think that it's, uh, I think it's extremely important. Um, I think it's, it's, if I could communicate one thing to, to people that are just getting into data science, it's probably um, ethics and understanding the power of the, the, the AI tools that we're that we're that we're building and, and the consequences, some of the negative consequences that can result from those tools. Um, I guess with that, uh, enough about me. I, I'll go ahead and jump into the content. Oh yeah, one other thing. Um, I just want to be very clear that uh, this is my presentation. This is my point of view. I work for for IBM, um, but this is not not uh, their point of view. This solely belongs to me. So all opinions. Funny jokes belong to me. Um, IBM has a whole department, and this is what they do, is they're focused on AI ethics, and I am not them. I just want to be very clear about that. All right, so AI uh, is something that, that has come to permeate all areas of, of modern life. Um, you know, if you get a new car nowadays, it comes with built-in AI. Um, you know, and this AI does all kinds of stuff. You know, it, it keeps you from backing into concrete poles. You know, um, it regulates your, sometimes it, it will break if uh, somebody stops in front of you. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great tool. It actually enhances, you know, our, our safety when we drive our cars. Um, also, and if you interact with a, uh, any kind of big company like Verizon or 
AT&T or, you know, whoever you go through their customer care, chances are your first interaction with that company is going to be with a chat bot. You know, even if you're using your phone, it's certainly going to be on a chat bot, but if you call in um, it's likely that they're going to take your voice, convert it to text. So a chat bot can figure out how to direct your call. You know um, you know, it's, it's kind of a mainstay now in modern customer care organizations. It's used big time, you know, in terms of from an advertising point of view, um, stimulating our purchase behavior. It also controls the news we see. I mean, most of us use a carrier computer in our pocket and we open it up and uh, a, a smartphone and we've got a news feed that's customized for us. So as a data scientist, this is really good, right? <laughs> you know, it's job security, right? It's this mushrooming technology over the last, and AI over the last 10, 10 years or so. Um, but what do people outside of, of data science think? Um, and I just got this off the internet, uh, but I've seen a lot of things, you know, um, that suggest similar things. A lot of research that says basically the same thing is that la less than half of adults believe AI is a good thing. And, you know, there's been a lot of uh, stories in the in media, movies and TV, you know, over the course of my lifetime about, you know, man creates AI and then AI eats man <laughs> kind of stories. You know, one of my favorite was, you know, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I don't know if you watch that show, but I used to watch it with my son when he was eight. Um, but he's 13 now and he, he thinks everything's dumb. But when he was eight, we used to really enjoy the show, the show together. And Mac, one of the characters on there said that I always worried that ro robots would try to kill me one day. So I got a special provision of my life insurance for death by robot, you know, and there's all kinds of examples of this. You know, you've got the Terminator movies, you know, the Matrix and my favorite Battlestar Galacta. And again, these are all stories of Man creates AI and AI, you know, kills man. Um, so there is a lot of negative thoughts towards AI. I mean, um, so as data scientists, we need to be cognizant of that, you know, and we need to make sure that the, the stuff we do is, is uh, accepted by people who are not, you know, knee deep in this stuff. So are these fears legitimate? Is my back MacBook gonna eat me this afternoon? Is it gonna jump up and take a bite out of my Bahancas? Um, no, it doesn't. It probably won't. Um, I, I don't know, but it probably won't try to eat me. But having said that, I, I think there is a lot of things that are going on with AI, AI right now that are having a negative impact on society. And a lot of things, honestly, that, that scare me to death. And I think this is the, the most important point that I'm trying to make today is that as data scientists, we build and we shape this AI and we put it into the world. And that is a tremendous power. Um, when you have the ability to launch AI that goes into the world, interacts with people, it has impact, it, it impacts real people living real lives. And, and I think with this opportunity, I think as data scientists, we have a tremendous responsibility to make sure that the AI we create is ethical and trustworthy. So how do we build uh, trustworthy and ethical AI? Um, and I don't have you know, all the answers. I mean, I don't, but, but here's three very concrete things that as data scientists that we can do to try to make this AI fair, uh, to try to make AI ethical AI um, so we can build trust among the public and also ensure that you know, the, this great power that we have is, is, is uh, this power that we have is, is used for good and not causing bad things to happen. So the three things I'm gonna talk about today in terms of how to build trustworthy and AI, ethical AI is one, build AI that is fair. Two, when appropriate, and it's not always appropriate, but when it's appropriate, build AI that is transparent. And three, I'm gonna talk about something that I call 21st century pollution. And I'll give some examples of this and, um, and talk about how we can possibly address it. All right, so number one, uh, building AI that is fair. Fairness just means that we treat every person equally, right? You don't wanna launch AI that gives preferential treatment to some people, right? Um, and, and the thing to understand about machine learning models is that, and I think a lot of times this is lost, but 
they're not crystal balls, right? They're not these magic things that 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 just uh, put everybody in a happy, fun place. Um, they simply look at past history data from the historical record, learn from that data, and project that into the future or the current time. So if you have a data set or a historical repository that includes racial, gender, or really, really any kind of discrimination, that machine learning model is not going to know to fix that. It's not going to automagically just go in there and correct that bias. It's going to take that bias and it's going to replicate it. Right. So if you've got a data set that's discriminate, discriminating against where discrimination is, is, is embedded, the AI is just going to take that information and project it forward. It's not going to fix it. You know, as an example, um, you know, if you have three ethnic groups in your society, you've got Grover's, Big Birds and Elmo's. And Elmo's are a group that have always been considered lower class and always discriminated against. Um, if you look in your historical data and you look, let's say you're trying to sell mortgage loans in this hypothetical um, world. Um, if you look in your historical data and you're trying to predict who's likely to get a mortgage, Elmo's are going to be at the bottom of the list, right? But the reason that they're bottom of the list is not because they want it or not, be not because they can't pay for their mortgage. It's because they've never had access in the past. So if you build a machine learning model on this type of, in this type of society, when you look at the probabilities on the other end, you're going to see your Elmo, your Elmo's are never going to be at the top of your, of your list in terms of predicting um, purchasing of, or being a predictor of, of purchasing your mortgage loan. So it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? So if you don't do something to correct that historical um, discrimination, then you're just going to repeat it over and over again. And that's exactly what we don't want to do. We don't want our AI, you know, showing preference to particular groups or discriminating against certain groups. So there, there are a few ways that in terms of like, um, so in terms of like uh, fixing when you have fixing your data, when you have this inherent bias kind of in your data set, um, there's really not a real great way to fix it. Um, there's usually what you have to do is you have to go in and you have to apply some kind of heuristics or business rule in addition to the machine learning model. And I actually have a paper on this um, out on Medium, if you want to check it out. It goes into a lot of detail with Python code um, and all those kind of things to, to show you different ways or, or different types of ways you can build heuristics to make sure that you, your, your uh, AI is fair. Um, and the other thing about this is you have to be careful, right? Because you can run into laws um, in regard to... Let's see. You can run into laws that you can break if your AI is discriminating against one particular group. All right, so when appropriate, um, you wanna make sure that you build AI that is transparent. And transparency is just the ability to explain a model in common language, something that everybody can understand. And um, when I talk about data science, I try to stay away from words like always and never. <laughs> um, because you know, I haven't I haven't clearly been in every situation that that exists, right? So, but what I will say is that every time I have ever built a machine learning model, um, I've had to decide uh, where to be on this trade-off, on this continuum between transparency and accuracy. And typically, the more transparent a model, the less accurate, and the more accurate a model, the less transparent. There's typically a, a a, um, an inverse relationship between the two. And again, um, you know, if you're trying to build trust in your models, there are certain situations where you have to be more transparent than others. Um, you know, if you're dealing in certain situations, you're going to be more transparent. Uh, in, certain, in some situations, transparency is a lot more important than in other situations. You know, and if you look at just two very simple models, um, or if you look at two models, uh, you know, like this is just a cross tab right here, right? So this is about as simple as you can get. You know, you've got, do you live on campus and then your class rank? So you can see, you know, if this is the dependent variable and this is the independent variable, you can see whether or not class rank has an impact on whether or not somebody lives on campus. 
this is very simple, very easy to understand, um, but probably not very accurate. This over here is, is uh, a deep learning model. And I mean, this diagram probably would scare many small children. Um, I mean, it looks pretty scary. Um, and the thing about these, these complex models like this is that they're typically uh, very accurate, but good luck on trying to get some kind of insight into what's driving your predictions. So we want, as data scientists, we want to make our models as uh, transparent as possible, right? Because the more transparent, the more explainability, the more people can understand what's going on kind of under the hood. Um, and sometimes it's even more important, you know, and how do you know, you know, where you need to, uh, or how do you know um, uh, how, how transparent your model needs to be? Um, well, I think there's, it, it really depends on the context. You know, so you have to ask yourself who's consuming the output. Um, you know, if you take, for example, if you have a machine learning model that predicts, um, you know, whether that, that, a that a lawnmower is, is getting old and needs part replaced. I think you can walk up to that lawnmower and say, Hey, you know what, Mr. Lawnmower, um, you're getting old and you need parts replaced. Um, I don't think the lawnmower is going to care. I mean, maybe they will. Um, but now if I walked up to a person, you know, a significant other and said, Hey, you know, I think you're getting old and you need parts replaced. I don't know that that would go over really well. <laughs> so the, the transparency of your model really depends on who's consuming it. Um, you also have to look at, um, is your purpose to explain or predict? You know, some problems aren't in inherently explanatory. Some problems are inherently um, predictive. Um, if you look at some example, some models or some uh, like pricing or advertising research, you know, if you're trying to predict pricing, you're not, if you're, if you're working on a pricing problem, you're not really trying to be build a model that's accurate. You're really trying to build a model that explains the relationship between um, price and output or quantity. Same thing with advertising effectiveness. You know, if you um, are trying to understand the relationship between ad spend and corporate revenue, um, then, uh, you know, in those kinds of situations, it's the relationship between spending and revenue, not necessarily the, the accuracy of revenue. Um, so those types of problem transparency is very, very important. And then also, I think you have to ask yourself, you know, what happens um, if the prediction is wrong, right? Um, you know, and I always give this example. I mean, the difference between, um, you know, uh, a remote batteries in your remote control and um, a uh, airplane engines, all right? So if my um, batteries go out in, in the remote control of my TV, that's annoying. But if airplane engines go out, well, <laughs> that, you might die, right? You fall from the sky. So transparency, like I said, is, it's, it's very important, but it's not important all the time. I mean, if you're dealing with people or you're dealing with situations where people want to know why something is happening, you need to make sure that your, your data science is, is as transparent as possible. And the more transparency you can make it, um, the more trust you're going to build, right? If you can tell somebody specifically why, they're, why the model is saying they're old and parts are, need to be replaced, um, that's going to go over a lot well um, than if you just say, <laughs> hey, guess what? You're, you're old and you need parts replaced. Um, you know, a, a why is, is very important when you're dealing with a human audience. Um, and again, sometimes transparency is um, important, sometimes it's not. But it's important that you understand the context of, of where you're doing the data science and where you're building the machine learning models so you can kind of see where it fits on that continuum between accuracy and, um, and explainability, okay? All right, then finally, I think we need to understand what I call 21st century pollution. And this is a bit more tricky than the first two. All right, so in economics, we have a concept called an externality. And uh, these can be good or bad, right? Um, you can have good externalities, you can have bad externalities, but the, the bad externalities typically are the ones that get the most attention, you know? And um, just, just imagine I've got this uh, factory where I'm making, I don't know, tires or baseball bats, it doesn't really matter. And I'm uh, 
making these products and I'm my profit margins are good and I'm happy, right? Things are wonderful. But what I don't know, or maybe I do, maybe I do know, maybe I don't know. It doesn't really matter. But as I'm making this product, I'm putting up smoke into the atmosphere, you no know, toxic gas in the atmosphere. And that toxic gas is being breathed in by the people that live around my factory and it's causing them to get sick. It's causing them to go to the hospital. And in some cases it could be causing them to make them die. Um, now the cost of all that healthcare and the death and all that stuff is not directly reflected in my profit margins, right? Um, we call that an externality or a pollution, right? And I think we have, I think we need to start thinking about AI as having pollution. Right. Because a lot of times and I'll walk through some examples where we have AI kind of in the wild running around out there and um, it's creating it's having negative effects on people um, that aren't necessarily reflected well, or aren't reflected in the profit margins of the companies that are designing and building and implementing this AI. Um, one example is like uh, AI driven advertising. Right. So. You know, when I look back to when I was a kid, um, advertising was pretty much a blunt instrument. You know, I mean, there was, you could do some things if you were trying to advertise your business. I mean, you could pick the yellow pages you wanted to be in. You could pick the, um, you know, the billboards where you wanted to put them, but it was pretty much mass in, in nature. Now it didn't happen overnight, but you fast forward to what we have today. We have a very, very highly, uh, media, our, our media is very, very highly targeted. So you can buy very, very specific advertising for very, very specific people. Um, and that's a good thing, right? I mean, if you think about it, you know, if you're a small business and let's say it would have taken you $10,000 to advertise your business for your business in 1980, now maybe you can do that for $1,000, right? So that's good. That's a good thing. Um, the bad thing <laughs> is that people that have um, bad intents and are up to no good in general can use that same mechanism to do bad things in society. Um, you know, theoretically, hypothetically, somebody could use that same mechanism that people are using to advertise their businesses and see discord in society um, or even influence elections. I mean, and those are things, those are bad things resulting from that, that aren't, those bad things, again, um, aren't reflected in the profit margins of the companies that are distributing. The cost of those bad actors is not reflected in the profit margins of the people that are delivering this AI. Same thing with news. I mean, you know, back in the 70s, I mean, you had, uh, you had news was pretty much designed to a broad audience, you know, I mean, you had uh, local newspapers and local news on the TV and you had, you know, Walter Cronkite telling you how, that's how it was every night at 530, every night at 530. So, um, you know, but you fast forward till today when literally we carry a, a computer around in our pocket and we literally have a news feed that's specific to us. And that's great, right? I mean, that's great because I get to, if I'm interested in, in LSU football or tiddlywinks or chess or whatever, I get news specifically for me related to LSU football, tiddlywinks or chess. The problem is, is that um, one of the, the costs that, that comes with that, you know, specif specificity, have trouble saying that word, um, is that a lot of times if the AI is giving us the news that we want, sometimes the news that we want isn't necessarily news that informs us it's it's can be sometimes it's news that is just what we want to hear and sometimes it can uh, just confirm our existing biases and um you know and the the other problem is is that we can kind of get in our own little bubbles right and we all have kind of our own little little worldview that's supported by the news that we read and um we never really see beyond that so it, it causes us to have trouble communicating to each other you know, and, um, you know, just some more examples. I mean, if you've ever had to, had to deal with, you know, mental illness or had a family dealing with mental illness, you'll know what I mean when I say that a lot of times it's difficult to distinguish between um, the, the person and the disease, 
And um, I can assure you that the AI um, developed and implemented today is can't distinguish between the, the, the disease and the person either. So you can have these situations that come up where like a, a teenage girl with anorexia <clears throat> and the AI is feeding this, this, uh, this person. But what they're really doing is, is they're not feeding the child, they're feeding the disease. Um, so they're making a, a person with anore anorexia, you know, her, her disease even worse. Um, you know, also another issue that we see with modern AI is that, you know, it's, it's designed to connect people, right? Um, and that's good. That's good. I mean, it's connecting people from all over around the world with similar interests. Um, the problem is that, you know, you can have people with really kooky ideas getting connected in ways that they normally wouldn't get connected. You know, you may have a, a guy, you know, in your hometown that's got some kooky ideas and now he can go online and connect all over the world with people that have the same kooky ideas. And, and that can be dangerous, right? You know, people with crazy ideas, you know, and you have things that even go viral within these kooky idea communities, right? You know, they, people in mainstream might not hear of it, but it becomes, you know, it goes from, it, it's viral in these ideas of people that, you know, maybe have these fringe ideas. So, and like I said, I, I think the parallel I draw, you know, with the, with the factory and the pollution, I, I, think, it, I think it applies here. Um, you know, I, I think of this, I like to think of this as like 21st century pollution, where the, you know, the, the example of, you know, a factory poking, uh, you know, pumping out toxic smoke to people that live in the area, that's more of a, you know, industrial age type of, of example. So how do you fix this? And again, I don't have all the answers. I don't. Um, I wish I did. <laughs> but, you know, you, you can really do two things. One, you can filter the content. Um, or two, you can change the algorithms. And, you know, if you filter the content, you run into lots of First Amendment issues in this country. Um, and, uh, you know, freedom of speech stuff, um, which makes changing the algorithm uh, seem a lot more plausible in terms of trying to fix this. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, just thinking about this real, just kind of at a very surface level, I mean, I don't have deep insight into every AI algorithm in the world, but I do know this, the output of most of these algorithms is a number. You know, the great thing about numbers is that they can be aggregated. You know, so if you can, and if you think about it like this also, like, you know, if you have like a, the, the simplest way to remove extremes from any data set is to aggregate it. So like, you know, if you have a time series and it's bouncing all over the place, right? And you want a smoother line, you take a moving average, right? You aggregate the data to take out the, the volatility and the extremes. And, um, you know, I think it's the, the, the specificness of this, this AI and what it's delivering that's causing the problems more times than not. And there's no reason why our news needs to be individualized. I mean, and there's no reason why I have to have news feed just for me. I mean, um, and a lot of times that's not good for me to have that. Um, there's no reason why a girl with anorexia, you know, needs to have a social media feed that's specific to her, you know? And so there's, there's, there should be ways that you can take these algorithms and just aggregate them. Like, for example, a girl with anorexia, instead of making it specific to her, a relevant social feed, but that's not specific to her might be better. Like, you know, maybe you take, you know, her gender, age, geography, I don't know. There's probably a lot of other things that make more sense, but there's no reason why if, if it's the specificness of the, 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 the social media that's, that's feeding her disease, there's no reason why it has to be that specific is what I'm saying. Um, same thing with news, you know, same thing with, with advertising, you know, I mean, you can't keep a bad actor from coming in and doing no good, but you could certainly make it a lot more expensive. You know, and um, I, I think you could also say that, you know, this, this types of ideas would be a lot less, would be a lot less likely to go viral, you know, if, if uh, we weren't so specific and so in such homogeneous groups like we are now. So anyway, that's uh, kind of what I have come to talk to you about today. And just to kind of sum up, you know, what we talked about, you know, how can we build AI that's, that's trustworthy and ethical? Um, you know, one, we can build AI that's fair, all right? Make sure that our AI is, um, doesn't discriminate against people. 
Uh, two, when appropriate, and like I explained, it depends on the context. It's not always a, it's not always a necessity, but when it is a necessity, make your AI as transparent as possible, even if that does come at a cost of accuracy. And, and third, I think we need to understand this, this things that I'm calling 21st century pollution and understand that there can be negative consequences of AI. And um, as data scientists, I think we need to identify that when it happens and take steps to fix it. Well, ideally prevent it from happening, but a lot of times you can't do that. A lot of times you can't see, um, you don't have a crystal ball. You don't know what's gonna come down the road, but um, when it does happen, fix it, right? Um, and I think if we could do those three things, um, I think we could see, I think AI would work better for society. And I think that and, and uh, would, it, would in turn um, build a lot more trust in the AI that we're building. So again, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for having me today. I really appreciate it. And uh, be glad to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much, Chad. Let's all appreciate him with a round of applause. <laughs> Uh, while you were speaking, there were a couple comments in the chat box. I'm going to read them for you and see if you want to comment back on them. Uh, sure. One of our one of our participants wrote that uh, she had never thought of the act of building models in the light of the heavy responsibility that it carries, and she thanked you for the context. Yeah, yeah, you know, because these these AI that we're creating, um, it's deciding on whether or not people get loans. Um, it's just deciding whether or not people get in the universities. I would think. I don't know. Um, it's deciding on whether or not people um, uh, get automobiles. It's, it's, it infiltrates our whole society. I mean, we're making decisions. Um, this AI we're creating is making decisions for real people. And it's something that we definitely need to take seriously. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, let's see what else is in here. So um, Sandy wrote, thank you for mentioning news bias in this context. And I, I agree that news bias yeah. is a big problem these days. And then Shilpi said, uh, she was pointing out that social media disinformation and polarization, as you mentioned, is also an issue. Did you want to make a further comment on that? Yeah, it's a real problem, you know, and, and, um, and like I said, there, there's, you know, filtering the content is, is, is I, I don't want to say it's impossible, but it's really difficult because the First Amendment issues, right? Um, and I think we need to seriously look at uh, these algorithms and make these algorithms more transparent in terms of what they're doing. And, um, you know, like I said, aggregation is the simplest way to take out extremes, you know? So if you can make it less specific to individuals, um, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the negative impacts that we're seeing um, I think it might take care of some of that, but I don't have all the answers. I mean, it's, I think, I think you, like I said, I think we're at a point with AI kind of like where we were at the, you know, the, the early late 1800s and the industrial revolution where mm -hmm. we had this, you know, this explosion in industrial activity and um, you know, that was great in a lot of ways, you know, but there was a whole lot of, of social side effects that went along with that, that we had to figure out over time. Um, mm -hmm. With AI, it's, it's, it's kind of similar. We're in a similar place. The problem with AI is it just happens so dang fast. You know, technology moves so fast. I mean, we have, I, I, that's what I worry about. It's not that, you know, that uh, we can't figure it out. It's that it just changes so quickly and that we may not be able to stay up with it. And in the meantime, we're being bombarded with all the messages coming from AI. So it's yeah. got to be, we have to take it into account. Dan wrote, thank you, Shad. A very informative a question. You mentioned using, and I'm not sure how to pronounce this word, heuristics? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. To avoid AI bias, what does that look like? Um, I wrote a whole paper on it, but just to give you an idea, I mean, like, uh, you know, like, let's say you've got, um, you've got three different groups going back to my Sesame Street characters you know, um, and you want to make sure that you don't have, if you build a machine learning model on that data and try to predict who's likely to buy a mortgage loan, you're going to get, you're going to, your machine learning is going to tell you that Elmo's are not very likely to buy. Well, that's not because, you know, they don't want the loan. It's just because they've been discriminated in the past. What you can do is you can set thresholds or, or quotas. It's another word for it. So that like, let's say you were sending out offers, um, make sure that a certain percentage, like if Elmo's, represent 30% of the population, make sure that 30% of your offers are go to Elmo's, 
right? So just ensure, and you have to do it with like a business rule or heuristic because the machine learning is never going to figure that out, unfortunately. Kind of sounds like affirmative action, right? You know, I didn't want to say that, but yeah. <laughs> I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm yeah. sorry to have said it. No, um, no. And, and there's other ways you can do it, like um, by, by uh, messing around with your sample, you know, um, but, you know, you can't change history by modeling history. I wish you could. It looks like Shanita Floyd has her hand raised. Shanita, would you like to open your mic and ask your question? Um, I put my question in the chat and that was just for you to provide a link to the article. And I just wanna thank you for um, thinking about others. Um, I truly appreciate it because uh, <laughs> we don't always get that appreciation um, that history has been not so good to some of us. Yeah, um, totally agree. And I mean, I think we have a moral, uh, a moral obligation to, to make it right and be fair, not just as data scientists, but just as humans. And then Tyler, Tyler, would you like to open your mic and ask a question? Oh, did we lose him? Okay, let's move on to William uh, while we wait for Tyler to join us again. Oh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks very much for the talk. Um, I was just curious, of course, in talking about this, you talked about those externalities, which are that, you know, the problem is that these, these problems that AI and, and uh, can introduce are generally outside the realm of the profit that the companies who are producing them make. And so there's not an immediate negative impact on the companies. And you're talking about, of course, how we as data scientists can try to be more conscientious in our own models to try to limit the harm that, that our own models might do. Do you have any thoughts, though, on how more broadly, how we would go about creating incentives for companies? I mean, as you were talking about, you know, you might aggregate news, a kind of targeted marketing in order to level out some of those more harmful effects, but presumably that also loses some degree of profitability to it as well. Yeah, it does. Uh, do you have any ideas to just to how we might more broadly try to incentivize that to say, no, this is something we need to do, even as it would presumably be costing the companies developing these AIs the money that they're developing the AIs to do? Yeah, I know, I know exactly what you're saying. And, and there's not a really a great answer for that. I mean, you know, I, I think, um, it, I, I think it takes some kind of government involvement. Um, just my opinion. Um, you know, and I think if we could just label for what it is, you know, it's not, you know, because a lot of times I think people want to just kind of, you know, get out there, go look for their bucket of blood from somebody, but it really is it's, it's think of it as like pollution, right? And just like we have to step in and the EPA gets involved when people are polluting. And, you know, I think we need something similar. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's just a classic externality in, in economic terms, negative externality. And, um, you know, the scary part is that, um, you know, it's just, it hap it, what's, what's difficult about this is that technology moves so fast and um, it's hard for, society to keep up so you know I, I think it's more i think if you can understand the algorithms and you can apply regulation there that's probably the most effective way to do it like regulating the size of cohorts that these companies can market to and make sure that they're not too homogeneous i mean that would be you know one thing you could do um, makes you know limit the size of a cohort for news right so yeah, you, each cohort, you can't make news more specific to, you know, a certain number of people. And that number of people has to be, have a certain level of heterogeneity into it. Um, but I, I mean, it's complicated. I don't have all the answers for sure. Looks like Tyler has joined us back. I'm sorry, Tyler. I don't know if we lost you or you lost us, but go ahead and ask your question. Uh, we don't hear you.
Elisa, he says he'll type his question in the chat. Okay, all right, let's, while he's typing, let's move on to Shilpi. Shilpi, how's her hand raised? So, Dr. Shad, hey. great presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Um, there was a slide about accuracy and transparency. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's always, I think, the, the biggest debate and the most difficult decision to make. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, as much as we would like to make it more transparent, um, why do you feel that the, the more complex the models are? I know you, you explained that in the diagram, it is harder. So assuming one that it is harder to explain if it is more complex, um, but the trust depends on how much we can explain, uh, like people feel comfortable and they put their trust. So how do you balance that? And where would you draw the line? You know, it, it depends on every situation. And, and what it comes down to a lot of times is you just can't be as accurate as you, as you can be, right? You have to sacrifice accuracy. You know, a good example of that that everybody can relate to is a FICO score. Mm -hmm. You know, here in the U.S., a FICO score is determined, you used to determine, you know, whether or not you get a loan. And, um, you know, if, but the FICO score is very, very transparent. Um, I know that all the banks have more accurate, ways to predict who's likely to default on a loan. Um, the problem is, is that it has to be explainable, right? Because of the context of that particular situation, you know, and, and, you know, it, it just, it, and it literally does depend on every situation because some situations you can get away with less transparency and that one you can't, right? Um, you know, when you're talking about, uh, you know, like the COVID testing right now, everybody's getting a lot of COVID tests and, you know, people tend to, pretty much accept the the act the result without a lot of questioning you know because there's an, an inherent yes. desire for it to be as accurate as possible i mean people aren't going to go in and say well you know i don't even know what it would be but tell me all of the different reasons why i tested positive you know what did you, <laughs> you know show me your lab um because people really want it to be as accurate as possible you know so it it really just does depends like for a long time i worked with sales reps you know, and I would provide machine learning models to sales reps. And you just can't tell a sales rep who's been selling a particular product for years. Um, you, know, you just can't tell them things without explaining it to them, you know? So in that case, you had to be, you had to use as much, uh, you had to make sure that you were as transparent to at least have him have some faith in what you were telling him. You know, if you're trying to predict machine failure, go for accuracy, you know, because the machine ain't going to care. I see. So what I'm hearing is where, when it comes to humans, you would choose transparency, but when it comes to machines, uh, then you would probably choose accuracy. In general, but then, you know, there are situations where humans aren't going to care either, like the COVID test, but, you know, so it just kind of depends. And um, there's not, there's not a good answer. It's, it's, it's an R it, it's, I see. it's Case part of the case. art. Yeah. Okay. Okay. okay, well, it looks like Tyler got his uh, question typed. So he wants to know, what do you think of efforts to decentralize AI? As the need for computational power grows, powerful AI becomes further out of reach for people. Yeah, so you mean um, like, uh, like from a distributed computing standpoint or from like, uh, um, for, or just from like it, it coming from so many different directions and being uh, Im impacting so many impacting you from from lots of different directions. Um, can you ex uh, can you hear me now? I think yeah, I might I fix the yes, mic. Yes, we oh, can. Yeah. Right. Okay. So uh, I, I more mean to where you're uh, you're basically like breaking up the computational uh, power, like a lot of times, like on the blockchain, like BitTens yeah. or other companies like that. Yeah, you know, I think is. And then this is just my perspective. I mean, as long as, you know, it, most of the, the, the problems that we see in AI come when it's delivered to the, when it's actually implemented and delivered, you know, so it's more about the point of um, where it's actually interacting with, you know, the, the person or the, the, the machine or whatever. So how it's computed on the back end um, is less of an issue. Um, as opposed to where it's actually delivered, you know, because it don't AI can only be delivered and you know is delivered in a very specific place, and that's where you know you kind of run into all these ethical issues. All right, perfect. Thank you. Mm.
And Dan has another question. He wants to know, uh, he would like you to discuss the trans, sorry, let me start over. <laughs> if you don't mind, in your discussion about transparency, it sounded a bit like there are psycholo psychology effects. Are there efforts to incorporate psychology into AI development? Yeah, absolutely. It's all psychological because you're dealing with um, you're dealing with people, right? And you're getting people to trust something. So, um, yeah, it, you know, it, and and um, you know, it, like if you look at a lot of things, um, like a lot of the software out there right now, um, it's designed in, in many cases to uh, give some tools of of explaining why predictions are made, and and even like. I say software, but even like on a, you know, on a website, like a lot of times you can go in and when you have an AI delivered, sometimes they'll have some explanatory reasons there behind. Like, um, you know, I'm, I keep going back to the FICO score, but usually with the FICO score, you know, typically they'll give you a little, you know, if you go on your credit card statement, it says, see your FICO score. If you click on that, there's usually, you know, a reason why, like your, your debt to income ratio is too high or something like that. Um, so yeah, I, and, and when it comes to, you know, implementing it and with real people, um, I think you have to look at those psychological effects. When, when I did a lot of stuff with sales reps, you know, years ago, you know, we would always have some kind of graphic there to, to explain why we were predicting you, they should do this because they needed to have some, and it needed to make sense and be logical to them. Okay, and then is it IJ? I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, but has two questions. The first question oh, yeah. is, uh, how does one balance this fairness with the organization's policy directions? And this sounds like it's coming from someone who would work for a company that does AI, right? Sometimes the organization may be skewed to profit over fairness. Yeah. And the, se the second question wants to know about your transition from economics to data science. So, um, you know, that's that's tough. That first question. Um, and I, I don't have a good answer for that, you know, because you work for a big company and a lot of times as a data scientist, you don't have a lot of control over, you know, what, you know, the policy is. And, um, you know, everybody just has to balance their own personal ethics with um, making a living, <laughs> you know, I mean, um, you know, and, and I've had just, just talking from my experience, you know, working in for 26 years in data science. I mean, there's been a couple of situations I just didn't feel comfortable in and I didn't run out and quit. I mean, it wasn't like I walked in there and I'm leaving the day, but, um, you know, eventually I, I did find my way into some other situation that was, you know, work for me, you know, and I, I said this, this isn't about IBM, this presentation is about IBM, but IBM is a very good we don't, we get a lot of things wrong. Don't get me, don't take it the wrong way, but it's a very ethical company and it's a place that I like to work and Verizon was the same way. Um, so, I mean, it's just a personal thing, but I, I get it. I, I totally understand what you're saying. Um, and uh, I've, I've had the same issues over before. Um, the other question was, uh, what was the other question? About what, what caused your Oh yeah, transition. economics. Yeah, from it can you know it's, metrics to yeah, it, it's it's crazy, but you know it's it's hard to imagine this now. But you know, data science didn't really exist when I got out of school. You know, so I kind of got in it because I wanted to do, um, uh, you know, you know, econ or applied research. You know, I was always interested in studying, you know, understanding why people do what they do, and that's kind of why I got in economics. And I went from there and started, you know, doing mod mo customer modeling of people. Um, you know, looking at why people buy certain products and predicting what products people are going to buy and um, looking at, uh, you know, you know, uh, what, what, uh, what employees firms should hire and things like that, and just kind of solving social science problems and, you know, which is what we did in economics. And over time, that became known as data science. <laughs> Along the way, I picked up, uh, you know, Python programming and SAS programming and all that kind of stuff. Very interesting. Um, and kind of speaking to what you already implied, Milan says it's correct that data scientists don't really have control. The direction has to come from the top. So choose your organization that you want to work for well, right? Like IBM yeah. and Verizon. Okay. Yeah. And uh, and Milan also provided his LinkedIn if anybody wants to keep in touch with him. And I saw also that Sandy has provided some links in the chat for your articles on Medium. 
Okay, cool. And and also your LinkedIn so that people can connect directly to you. Awesome. Um, looks like you're getting lots of thank yous in the oh, chat. Yes. I enjoyed and, it. Thank you very much. And Dean Kinshuk had to leave, so he wanted to, me to also personally thank you from him. Um, does anyone have any further questions? Did I miss any questions in the chat? There was so much chatter. I may have overlooked something. Going once, going <laughs> twice. Oh, a new message. Let's see. Oh, just a thank you. Another thank you. So, Shad, we really appreciated your talk today. And yeah. I hope you'll get some connections out of this. Uh, people can learn more from you and read your articles. Um, yeah. I see lots, lots more uh, comments in the chat if you want to read them. And um, I thank you everybody for coming to today's code series presentation.